I'm Amelia, and a few weeks back, I lost my dad after a long struggle with his health. I often catch myself wishing I could have introduced him to his grandchildren, a thought that brings a heavy sigh. Six years ago, at 35, I got married. During that joyful day, my dad and I made a heartfelt promise. I would tell him first if I was expecting. Sadly, that's a promise I'll never fulfill, and it's my biggest regret concerning my dad. His sickness was diagnosed a year ago, and since then, I've put all my effort into being there for him. I visited my childhood home more often, spent numerous hours at the hospital alongside my mom, and made sure to call or video chat even more frequently. Despite all this, I sometimes wonder if it could have been enough. I could have done more, I whispered, lost in thought. My mom, always supportive, comforted me, Amelia, you did everything you could. Your dad knew that, and he was proud. Just then, my sister Freya walked in, followed by a man I guessed was around 48, presumably the lawyer. This is Jack, the attorney, she introduced him, and my mom quickly offered him a seat. As soon as we all settled down, Freya couldn't help herself. The lawyer mentioned dad left us a significant inheritance. I couldn't help but respond, Freya, you know it's not all yours. That exchange soared the mood instantly. My sister and I have had a rocky relationship, worsened by our dad's illness. Her refusal to visit our dad, despite my attempts to bridge the gap between them, didn't help matters. Her attitude has always been a barrier, and it only grew more pronounced during these tough times. In hindsight, my words to my sister might have been a bit too sharp, fueled by my concern for our father. However, her response didn't help the situation either. You're grown up, there's no need to be so obstinate, I pointed out, to which she snapped back, I'm not being obstinate. Living in the city and traveling to the countryside isn't as simple as you think. It's just a three-hour drive, I countered, but she argued. Those three hours are not just about time, it costs money. And yes, money is important to me. I'm busy, so please, just stop nagging me. That marked the end of our conversation. Despite the distance, I always believed she could make an effort to visit now and then. This belief was a major factor in the swift decline of our relationship. Ultimately, she never visited our father, and the rift between us only deepened. The tension in the room grew until the lawyer stepped in, suggesting we all take a moment to calm down. I'm sorry, I said, offering an apology, which seemed to ease the atmosphere slightly. The lawyer then explained, as I mentioned over the phone, I'm here regarding your father's will. My mother, puzzled, whispered, when was this arranged? The lawyer replied, a few weeks before he passed, your father reached out to me. He asked you to come to the hospital, my mother asked. Yes, I drafted the will there with him, in the presence of his primary doctor. It was arranged that the doctor would notify me upon your father's passing which is why I contacted you now, the lawyer clarified, pulling out a white envelope and placing it before us. Recognizing my father's handwriting on the envelope, I whispered, that's definitely dad's handwriting. Freya, visibly impatient, demanded, just get on with it. What does it say? You know I'm busy. The lawyer, with a hint of a smile, opened the envelope. Inside, there was a single piece of paper outlining the inheritance, the house, land, some savings, and a storage shed. We were aware of the house and land, but the mention of a storage shed was new to me. My sister, frustrated, turned to the lawyer, wait, what about the farm? The farm? The lawyer echoed, a bit surprised. Yes, the farm. Dad used to work on it as a hobby, I explained. Our father had run a successful business in a nearby town, but decided to slow down after turning 52, considering closing the company to spend more time on his hobbies, including the farm. This new mention of the farm added another layer of complexity to our father's legacy and what he left behind. During my high school years, I remember expressing a desire to take things a bit slower in life. My sister, who was attending college at the time, didn't agree with this laid-back approach. 
However, both my mom and I, concerned about my dad's health, supported the idea. Don't fret over finances, Freya. We're well prepared with savings, my dad comforted her. With some reluctance, she gave her nod of approval. Following this conversation, my father indeed wound down his business operations and took up farming close to our home. There's something fulfilling about working with the land, he would say, his face lighting up with joy. Witnessing his happiness reinforced my belief that we had made the right decision, though Freya seemed less convinced. Despite promising to return home post-graduation, she pursued a career close to her university, eventually marrying a CEO of an IT firm she met through her job. That's the backdrop to my father embracing farming until his health declined. Freya insisted the farm be considered part of the inheritance. Upon her insistence, the lawyer re-examined the documents and uncovered that the farm was actually leased land. Rented? I thought aloud, mistakenly believing we owned a substantial tract of land. Freya appeared visibly let down by this revelation. The realization that the expansive land my father had used for vegetable farming was least seemed to ease my initial disappointment. Knowing little about farming ourselves, perhaps it was for the best. The discussion then pivoted to how the inheritance would be divided. The house and the surrounding land will go to the wife, the lawyer outlined. Freya smirked, perhaps thinking about the remainder of the assets and how they would be split. The rest, including the savings and the storage shed, should be divided between you three, the lawyer suggested. Savings? That means cash, right? I'll take that, Freya stated, eyeing the liquidity. The total savings amount to approximately $100,000. This sum is not subject to inheritance tax, the lawyer informed us. I want the $100,000 in cash, Freya declared with a sense of victory. But such a one-sided arrangement didn't sit right with me, and I voiced my objection. Hold on, I don't agree. Why should you get all the cash? I protested. Because I'm the eldest, she argued, as if that settled it. Fine, you can have the storage shed. What's that even worth, anyway? She dismissively added, turning her attention back to the lawyer for further clarification. It's the shed adjacent to the farm. Whoever inherits it will own the structure, the land it's on, and anything inside it, the lawyer explained. Suddenly interested, Freya's attitude shifted at the mention of additional land. It struck me as odd married to a successful CEO, yet her appetite for more seemed insatiable. As the lawyer explained the details about the storage shed, he mentioned it came with a small patch of land, roughly 75 square feet, about the size of a cozy bedroom. He then laid out some photographs of the shed for us to see, showing its exterior and interior. The shed looked quite neglected from the outside, and inside it housed only simple gardening tools like hoses, scissors, and shovels, nothing that caught the eye as particularly valuable. My sister made a face of distaste upon seeing the photos. I don't want this, she declared, scrutinizing the images. They indeed showed nothing more than everyday items, valuable more for their memories than any monetary worth. Fine, you take the cash. I want nothing to do with that rundown shed, she stated, clearly eager to distance herself from what she saw as an unworthy inheritance. Hold on, that seems unfair, I protested, realizing the imbalance in the division. My sister had swiftly agreed to take the cash, knowing it was the more valuable asset, leaving me with what she saw as worthless. Her insistence made me feel cornered, especially when my mother mentioned, as long as Freya doesn't voice any complaints later, I see no issue with this arrangement. Complain? Why would I? Freya quickly agreed to the division, content with securing the cash for herself, leaving me with the shed. I couldn't hide my dissatisfaction, but before I could argue further, Freya dismissed my concerns, accusing me of being overly sentimental. You care more about our father than money, right? She challenged, leaving me momentarily lost for words. Indeed, family should be valued over money, but her swift conclusion to the conversation left me feeling unsettled. 
In the end, my mother inherited the house and land, Freya happily took all of dad's savings, and I was left with the neglected shed. After agreeing to the division, Freya even signed a document promising not to raise any disputes over how the inheritance was split, laughing confidently as she did so. I couldn't contain my frustration and later expressed my grievances to my mother. Why didn't you support me? I asked, feeling let down. My mother insisted she had helped, claiming her intervention had ensured I received the shed. But I'm not pleased with just the shed, I argued, unable to see its value. You might discover something unexpectedly wonderful if you give it a chance, my mom suggested optimistically. Despite my frustrations, her words sparked a faint glimmer of hope. Maybe there was more to the shed than met the eye, a thought that left me pondering as I tried to reconcile with the day's events. After receiving the key from the lawyer, I made my way to the shed situated beside the field, a serene 20-minute walk from our house along a rarely trodden rural path. The field, which my father had leased until his recent hospitalization, lay fallow, giving the surroundings an untouched, solemn atmosphere. Unlocking the shed, I was greeted by a thick layer of dust, a testament to its long neglect. Wow, it's dusty, I remarked, the air heavy with the scent of disuse. Despite the initial disappointment, I held on to the hope that something of my father's a keepsake perhaps might be hidden within. As I surveyed the interior, it quickly became apparent that the shed was exactly as it seemed, a simple, utilitarian space filled with the tools of farming. These items, while potentially holding sentimental value, didn't immediately stand out as particularly special. Maybe I should just take what's inside for now, I considered, my eyes scanning the dim, cluttered environment. That's when I sensed something peculiar about the shed's dimensions. It appeared smaller on the inside than it did from the outside, a discrepancy that puzzled me. Could it have been a trick of the light, or was my mind playing tricks on me? Stepping outside for a clearer perspective, I remained intrigued by the anomaly. Driven by curiosity, I decided to explore the shed's exterior, circling to its rear. There, hidden among a dense thicket of trees, I discovered a second door. Wait, another entrance at the back? I gasped. The interior wall of the shed had shown no signs of this door. From the inside, it seemed as if there was only one way in or out. This realization hinted at a concealed space, accessible only from this mysterious rear entry. A surge of excitement washed over me. Could this be one of Dad's secrets? He had a penchant for surprises, delighting in the unexpected joys they brought, much like the surprises he planned for my birthdays. Memories of those times brought tears to my eyes as I re-entered the shed, determined to find the key to this hidden door. Sure enough, after a thorough search, I found three keys ingeniously hidden within the handle of a shovel. Rushing to the rear door with a hopeful heart, I inserted one of the keys, and with a satisfying click, the door swung open. Inside this cramped, secluded space stood a large safe, solitary and imposing. Is this from Dad's company? I wondered aloud, the presence of the safe sparking a whirlwind of questions. What secrets did it hold? Was this my father's way of leaving a final, tangible piece of himself behind? The discovery hinted at layers of my father's life that I had yet to uncover, a personal treasure hunt he had laid out for me to embark upon. I instantly recognized the safe as the one that used to sit in the corner of my father's office, a sight I remembered from my childhood. Embracing it, I was washed over by nostalgia, this safe was a tangible connection to my father, making the inheritance all the more meaningful. Yet, knowing my dad, this discovery felt like just the beginning of his final surprises for me. There's got to be more, I whispered to myself as I used the second key to unlock the safe. The door creaked open, revealing contents that left me utterly amazed and unexpected legacy. Realizing the importance of sharing this discovery, I quickly secured the safe and went to inform my mother. Afterward, with my husband's assistance, we transported the safe from my parents' home. 
It dawned on me that these valuable items, undoubtedly part of my inheritance, might have tax implications. Determined to handle this properly, I decided to seek legal advice. Following the lawyer's suggestion, I contacted a certified public accountant, CPA, recommended by a friend, to navigate the potentially complex tax situation. This professional took charge of the intricate details, ensuring everything was in order. A year of navigating these matters had passed when, unexpectedly, my sister showed up near my home. Her visit was out of the blue especially considering our recent strained relationship over the inheritance. I was just in the area, she claimed, but her uneasy demeanor and the fact that we lived 30 minutes apart made her visit seem less than casual. Despite our complicated history, I invited her in. After serving coffee, she appeared restless, eventually asking, did you win the lottery or something? Her questions puzzled me. I never played the lottery and it wasn't the season for my husband's holiday bonus. What are you getting at? I finally asked, seeking clarity on her bizarre insinuations. Her mood shifted suddenly to irritation. Are you making fun of me? She accused. Her reaction puzzled me even further, as her line of questioning seemed completely out of left field. I had no idea what could have prompted such an inquiry or why she would think I had come into a sudden windfall. Apart from the mysterious contents of the safe that only my family knew about, my sister was practically buzzing with curiosity about the subject of money, insisting that I must have come into a significant sum. She recounted a recent encounter with our aunt in the city, who unwittingly sparked her curiosity. Our aunt had mentioned receiving a $1,000 gift card for me as a thank you for visiting our father during his illness. This gesture led my sister to speculate wildly that I had stumbled upon some unexpected fortune. You've come into some money, haven't you? Just admit it, she pressed me for answers. Understanding the root of her inquiry, I let out a sigh, which only seemed to irritate her further. What's with the attitude? Are you making fun of me? She demanded. I tried to explain it was simply a gesture of appreciation which led her to question the source of the funds for such gifts. I reminded her of the inheritance, specifically the dirty shed she had disdainfully mentioned, and revealed the discovery of the safe inside it a true treasure trove left by our father. The safe contained a collection of valuable watches, a passion of our father's. Though unsure of their exact worth, it was evident they held considerable value, especially given the modest amount of savings left. This revelation led to a discussion about the potential need for paying inheritance tax, a concern my mother had raised upon learning of the safe's contents. What should I do, Mom? I asked, seeking her wisdom. My mother advised handling the matter transparently, suggesting that such secrets have a way of coming to light eventually. Following her counsel, I reached out to the lawyer we had previously consulted, who clarified that the value of inherited items indeed determines the applicable inheritance tax. This led me to take the responsible step of accurately declaring the inheritance, ensuring compliance with the legal and financial implications of my newfound wealth. In seeking professional advice, I learned that a certified public accountant, CPA, could efficiently manage the valuation and tax obligations of the inherited watches for me. In trusting this task to the accountant, we discovered the collection was valued at a staggering half a million dollars. Given their high value, the implication was clear, inheritance tax was due. The sensible course of action, as advised, was to retain only those pieces that held sentimental value to me and sell the others to someone who could appreciate and afford them. This approach not only made financial sense, but also felt right emotionally. From the proceeds of the sale, I managed to cover the inheritance tax and also extend my gratitude through gift cards to relatives who supported us during my father's illness. This is what had sparked my sister's curiosity. Among the keepsakes I chose to keep was my father's pocket watch, a piece not of great monetary worth but rich in memories. I shared this story with my sister, showing her the pocket watch, 
trying to convey its sentimental value. However, her reaction was lukewarm, seemingly more interested in what was sold than what was kept. When she inquired about the remaining watches and the whereabouts of the safe, I informed her it was at our mother's house, explaining the safe size and its historical significance to our father's business. Her response was contemplative, leaving me feeling uneasy about her intentions. Yet, she departed without further questions, to my relief, though I couldn't shake off a lingering sense of worry. My fears were somewhat confirmed that very night. A distressing call from my mother urged me and my husband to hurry to her house. As we neared, the scene was alarming red lights flashing in the darkness, police cars stationed outside. Making my way through the gathering crowd, I found my mother and learned of the evening's harrowing events. She had been preparing for bed when unusual noises startled her. It sounded like someone was frantically searching through the house. Believing a burglar had broken in, and with no one else home to help, my mother made a quick decision to escape through a window, a move driven by fear and desperation. The situation she described was unnerving, painting a night filled with panic and uncertainty. Under the veil of night, my mother noticed the eerie glow of a flashlight moving inside the house, confirming her fears of a burglary. In a state of panic, she sought help from our neighbor, who, upon witnessing the suspicious activity, wasted no time in calling the police, convinced a burglar was at large. Yet, the supposed intruder was none other than my sister, Freya, who had decided to search the safe after hearing about my inheritance earlier that day. Without any way to identify her intentions, both my mother and the neighbor were understandably alarmed. The situation escalated when the police arrived. Caught off guard and enveloped in guilt, Freya attempted to flee the scene, her actions fueled by a misguided panic. Ironically, her escape efforts led her to collide with the safe's door, causing the unsteady safe to topple over and trap her underneath. This accident led to her being rushed to the hospital with complaints of leg pain, leaving us all in disbelief over her reckless actions. Following this chaos, my mother and I found ourselves apologizing to the responding officers for the misunderstanding. I also felt compelled to inform Freya's husband about the incident only to discover from him that Freya had been harboring a significant amount of debt due to her extravagant spending on luxury items. Their recent argument had culminated in her storming out, determined to borrow from mom to settle her financial woes, unbeknownst to us that she had already depleted her inheritance in an attempt to cover her debts. Freya's husband, already on edge from discovering the extent of her financial mismanagement, declared his intention to divorce her upon learning of her latest escapade. This revelation shed light on Freya's desperate actions that night, which had led to a tumultuous scene at the hospital where her husband broached the subject of divorce. The entire ordeal unfolded into a dramatic clash, underscoring the profound consequences of Freya's actions and the turmoil they had wrought upon our family. Freya was adamant, insisting, I'm not getting a divorce, absolutely not. Yet, the reality of her situation became undeniable when her husband presented the divorce papers. Faced with the stark evidence of their fractured relationship, she found herself with no option but to sign them. Now, confined to her hospital bed with a mixture of shock and resignation, she's turning the pages of a part-time job magazine evidently scheming on ways to tackle her debt through newfound employment. This turn of events, while unfortunate, offered a glimmer of hope that she might finally take responsibility for her actions. In the wake of these tumultuous events, I made a significant decision myself to return to my childhood home. The chaos had certainly stirred a deep concern for my mother's well-being in me, but another, happier reason spurred my decision I discovered I was expecting. After much discussion, my husband and I agreed that moving back would be best, allowing us to lean on my mother's support with our growing family. Though I regret that my father couldn't be part of this joyous news, I find comfort in believing he would have shared in our happiness. As I navigate this new chapter, the anticipation of welcoming a healthy child 
fills me with a sense of peace and forward-looking optimism, despite the recent family strife.